Last week, Maria and I sat down with a few of the members of the Glasgow iGEM team to learn about their project and their overall experiences during their internship so far. Uh, for those of you who don't know, iGEM stands for the International Genetically Engineered Machine, which is an independent and nonprofit foundation that promotes education and competition through the advancement of synthetic biology. They try to develop uh, open community and collaboration and each year. Teams from all over the, over the world develop and present their projects at MIT in Massachusetts in the US um, for different kinds of awards and medals from bronze to gold. The Glasgow team is headed stateside in November to present their project during the final um, iGEM competition. This year, the Glasgow iGEM team is working to develop a biosensor for Campylobacter, which is a main contributor to food poisoning. And they're using genetic, genetic approaches and engineering to develop different kinds of components that are required for this biosensor and its microfluidic housing. And they're also trying to address social policy management and public engagement issues that are associated with applying this type of bi biosensor. Um, so we spoke to five different uh, team members. The first team member that we spoke to was Ambra, who is a business and politics student. And her part uh, of this team is to look into public engagement and policy components of the biosensor project. Um, we know that iGEM is very involved on social media, but also is kind of a, a more international It is, group. it is, yes. Um, iGEM is a student competition. Um, it's an international student competition because it's led by the MIT in Boston. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so just this year, I think it's over 300 um, teams coming from both an undergrad or a postgrad background or even from high schools mm. um, so over 300 teams this year are taking part to the competition and then we'll have to present our final findings in Boston in November. Oh, very fun. Yes, <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's nice. fine. We've actually just booked flights, so we're actually... Yeah. Good to uh, know yeah, you're we're going. excited. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah, so that is definitely happening. And yeah, so we'll be in Boston to present our project mm -hmm. along with over 300 more teams. Cool. And yeah, of course, it's a, it's a competition. So uh, there will be specific prizes and specific medals that um, each team is awarded. Mm -hmm. um, I think we're doing quite fine, to be honest, at the moment. Yeah. And we are keeping track of the requirements um, for each medal. Um, and we're sort of just trying to go over them um, step by step. And I, I think um, we're doing things proportionally to what the requirements are. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we're on track for a gold mm -hmm. this year. Can you nice. give us a little bit of just a overview of what the um, competition is about this year mm -hmm. and what your team is, is working on? Is doing, yeah, yeah. sure. So the competition itself is in synthetic biology. Um, so each team, there are different um, categories, but each team can compete for um, something related to food safety or just engineered biosensors or just anything really that has to do with synthetic biology. Mm -hmm. um, we can we can choose and pick our own projects, so no one really asked us to go in a specific direction and this year um, we chose to make a genetically modified biosensor mm -hmm. um, to detect Campylobacter in food and poultry mainly um, mm -hmm. because Campylobacter is mainly found, it's a bacteria mainly found in chicken, in raw chicken and um, that usually dies when chicken is cooked at 42 degrees um, but what we're mainly worried about is cross contamination because when you cut chicken, it can just the bacteria can just um, spread over other surfaces or other yeah. foods, so you can still get contaminated. Um, so we're um, planning, we're working to make a biosensor that would detect Campylobacter mainly from surfaces or other foods, not necessarily from chicken. And we thought it was quite important as a cause because. None of the previous iGen teams had done that, and we're actually the first iGen teams in over 10 years to um, to do that, to actually deal with Campylobacter. Um, so we thought it was 
quite a new idea, quite innovative. And it's actually quite important as well because Campylobacter is the main cause for food poisoning in the UK. Mm-hmm. And the government spends a lot of money. I think the numbers are over £90 million pounds every year wow. um, <laughs> for the NHS and also work leave um, caused by Campylobacter infections. Mm. Um, so yeah, we're working towards that. Our team is, um, we're 10 people, um, 7 geneticists, um, 2 biomedical engineers and me. I'm not a scientist. <laughs> <laughs> I actually come from a social science background. I do politics and business management. A different kind of scientist. Yeah, a yeah. different kind of <laughs> scientist. And so I'm actually doing the human practices for this year's project. Mm. Um, so what I'm doing is just examining, evaluating the political and legal and social impacts that our project has. Mm-hmm. Um, and from both a legal perspective, because um, we're looking at EU regulations as well as UK regulations for both um, uh, biosensors, so GMO biosensors mm-hmm. will be, and just poultry generally, so the regulations that... Um, and anything that has to do with actually um, agriculture or just um, chicken and poultry itself. And then we're having a look at public engagement as well because we just want to raise awareness on the issue Mm -hmm. because we think it's so important. Mm -hmm. Um, So we're trying to um, do that as well along with human practices. Mm -hmm. And how did you get involved in in the project? Sounds like iGEM is generally tends to be more on the biomedical or it biological is. sciences or engineering. It um, is. So how how did you get? Yeah, it's involved? actually the first time iGEM got a social science student involved, and mm-hmm. I wasn't really expecting that because um, I remember I was just looking at internships. I do business and politics, so I was looking at the boring internships with banking and stuff like that (laughs) Um, but I wasn't really too keen on them to be honest so I was just looking for a research opportunity and because I would like to do a PhD after my undergrad and I remember I spoke to one of my lecturers for politics and he's quite interested in research as well and he told me about iGEM and they this year they happened to be looking for a social scientist because they wanted someone to just deal with human practices mm-hmm. because it never had just one person doing it before. Mm-hmm. And I think it's quite it's actually quite useful to actually split the tasks between different people so each one of us knows exactly what we're mm-hmm. doing. Yeah, sure. Yeah. You explained the idea, but did you have like lots of different projects and then you did like brainstorming to come down to this specific one or? Yes, it was actually quite tough to come up with an idea um, because at the very beginning of the project, uh, that is to say even before exams, because we started the project um, beginning of June Mm. and the project is supposed to go on for 10, 12 weeks. Um, But before the start of the project, because we wanted to have an idea when we started, um, we decided to just do some brainstorming and go over some ideas we had. So each one of us had to come up with just an idea that Mm -hmm. we had, something we would like to work on, just either a scientific issue that hasn't been solved or just something we're particularly interested in. So each one of us presented that, but none of the ideas were the right idea that we're doing now so Mm. it was actually sort of a combination between multiple ideas Mm. that we had and one of the geneticists um, had the idea of making a biosensor and we thought it was quite interesting because we also have two biomedical engineers so they were quite excited what they do making a biosensor Um, but we didn't really know what to make it for we were thinking about food poisoning Mm -hmm. And we had different options exploring food poisoning, so we considered salmonella and campylobacter. But then we saw that none of the IDEN teams had done campylobacter before, so thought, yeah. why not? Let's do this. <laughs> and it's it's actually working quite well at the moment because um, we found that we can actually detect something within the campylobacter bacteria that could easily be detected by our biosensor. We have sub-projects sub within mm. our team, so 
um, I'm a team myself. <laughs> yeah, 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 I do human practices, but the other guys um, sort of have a sub project um, split between two or three people. So each one of us is working on something different, and then we're planning on um, putting it all together by the end of the project. So we have split the tasks. Yeah, yeah. So apart from the metal that you, of course, you're going for. Are these ideas put into applications? That really depends on our ability to actually produce a function by a sensor mm -hmm. because clearly it is a student competition. Yeah. It's only 10 to 12 weeks. Yeah. Um, so it will be quite ambitious yeah, to actually course, produce yeah. something functioning within such a limited amount of time. Um, Although in the past we witnessed um, people uh, working in iGEM, so starting with iGEM, um, whose projects have actually gone on and mm -hmm. they produce something um, useful. I don't know if you've ever heard of the Arsenic Biosensor Collaboration. Um, basically it's just a, a group of people, they're now almost all of them lecturers in Edinburgh mm. and the rest of the UK. Um, that started off with iGEM, so they had this idea of making a biosensor that would detect um, arsenic in water. And the idea started off with an iGEM project, and then someone liked it, thought it was quite useful, thought it was, they thought it was quite well done. Um, so they're actually still working on it 10 years later, mm. um, not because the biosensor does not work, but because it's constrained by some political and legal issues, the yeah. ones I was talking about before, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, because um, unfortunately in the European Union at the moment we cannot use um, GMO biosensors mm -hmm. outside of a properly licensed lab, mm -hmm. um, so that's why it's so hard to actually gain approval from the European Union yeah. to, to do that. But yeah, I mean, a lot of iGEM teams have actually produced um, something really useful, something they can actually use in real life. Um, so, of course, the uh, ideal project would be that. Would be, mm -hmm. But at the moment, we're just um, being quite realistic. We're trying to do our best and we're hoping to have one by the end of the project. And certainly, like, a biosensor um, is interesting from a systematics perspective it's interest or a synthetics perspective you know it's also interesting from an engineering and biological perspective yes. that still doesn't necessarily take into consideration what it would mean to make it applied yeah yes you know and yes. it's not just yes we can apply it it's okay but we are you allowed need, to? <laughs> yes, exactly. We still need to actually confirm with other people. Yeah. Although I would say the main challenge at the moment is actually predicting whether or not these laws, these regulations will stay yeah. uh, within national legislation because, of course, we don't know whether or not in two years' time we'll be applying EU law or yeah. just coming up with some new national law. Mm -hmm. So I think that's the main challenge at the moment, just predicting what Brexit will be like, really, mm -hmm. um, in terms of laws and regulations that regulate um, GMOs or mm -hmm. just um, agriculture in general. Yeah, yeah. so that's a good segue into um, kind of social media and, and public outreach. What kind of things has your team been doing to engage more with the public with respect to your project? At the moment we're mainly aiming to just raise awareness on what Campylobacter is because mm -hmm. um, um, I, it was a campaign promoted uh, by the government, the Acting on Campylobacter Together campaign and um, has been promoted for over five years now um, and they've actually collected data suggesting that people do not know what Campylobacter is. Mm -hmm. And even though it's actually the main cause of food poisoning in the UK, they still don't know what it is, where it comes from. So we would like to raise more awareness on the issue itself. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, we're just being published on a few magazines uh, by the GIST, that's mm -hmm. just a Glasgow mm -hmm. magazine for science and technology. Mm -hmm and just the campus newsletter, the school newsletter here at the University of Glasgow. And we are going to the Science Centre, the Glasgow Science Centre mm -hmm. next month, nice. um, to just 
do an activity with kids and visitors in general um, to raise awareness on the issue of Campylobacter and on the fact that food um, can be can have bacteria even though we don't see them. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's important to actually make sure um, that we know how to prevent that from happening, how to actually um, try and stop at least food poisoning from happening. Yeah. And so it would be ideal to actually show them that the bacteria is still there, even though we can't see it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Nice. Um, so how have you been using your um, kind of expertise in, in politics and um, to, to, to think about the applications of, of this project? Um, what kinds what kinds of things have you been working on specifically mm-hmm. um, in part of this team? Um, at the moment, I've been mainly working on, as I said, the legal and political issues because um, what I was mainly concerned about was the fact that we could not use a biosensor outside of a licensed lab. Um, so I wanted to know more about that. I wanted to know more about the process that we actually... Mm-hmm have to undertake to gain approval from um, political bodies to actually use the biosensor. Um, So I've been mainly looking at regulations and laws that that define that, um, as well as the regulations that define how um, chickens or poultry or food in the UK, as well as in Europe, um, what sort of regulations they have to comply with, um, and why some chicken is has campylobacter and why some other chicken does not have campylobacter so what are the different processes that um chickens or farms in general um use to actually prevent that um from just appearing in a chicken because there must be a difference between um a chicken that doesn't have campylobacter from one that does and therefore I would like to see uh, what are the practices that leave there um, and whether they're more expensive or whether there are different issues that are impacting on that. Mm-hmm. And um, another thing I've been working on is just the social impact that our our work will have. Um, so just um, understanding what people will think about the biosensor, whether or not they will use it whether we want to use it in an industrial setting or in a domestic setting Mm -hmm. and that will be different from the kind of stakeholders we want to approach and so we're mainly looking at those different options and actually see what is best for our project and what is best for the public as well because Mm -hmm. some people might generally just not be interested in using it Um, but some restaurants, um, for instance, might, mm-hmm. um, because they want to make sure they complied with certain um, hygiene and quality um, requirements. Um, so in that case, they might actually want to use mm-hmm. the biosensor, um, because at the moment, detecting Campylobacter takes about seven days, because they actually have to swap the food, send it back to a lab, and then wait for the results to come mm-hmm. through, and it takes up to seven days. Right. Um, whereas the biosensor will give an immediate result. Mm-hmm. And probably will be less expensive, I yes, assume. Yes, definitely. Yeah. We're working on that as well, just mm-hmm. working on seeing what the what the economic impact yeah. will be, really, mm-hmm. because yeah. we want something cheaper, of course. Yeah, there wouldn't be yeah. a point to actually producing something more yeah. expensive. Um, so I think what I'm doing at the moment is just um, examining these different perspectives on, um, on what our project is. And I think... And what I've studied in the past, where I still study at universities, gave me a good mindset to do that because um, we still have always have to look at new policies, always have to look at how the politics works because, mm-hmm. of course, that will impact um, greatly on what we are actually able to do. Yeah. Um, so we are just doing different analysis to actually examine that. Mm-hmm. And where do you get your data? Do you pro- do you provide people with surveys now, or are you doing kind of data mining? Of... We were actually planning on doing that, uh, but um, that campaign I was telling you about, the Acting Campylobacter mm-hmm. campaign, because that has been going on for over five years, and it was all over the UK, and it was promoted by the government, of course they had access to a bigger 
public. Mm -hmm. So we're actually trying and get data from them instead of having just a smaller reduced That's public nice. that yeah. Yeah, um, you can have access. wouldn't be yeah, yeah. really realistic. Yeah. So cool. we're probably going to have that use that one. Yeah. Would you say that your time working on this iGEM project has helped you focus your own studies or your own kind of future interests and goals? I think it has, yes, definitely, because I already knew I was interested in research, but um, having such a practical um, and direct impact has actually helped me to see that that's pretty much what I want to do. Mm -hmm. So hopefully I might do a PhD or I might just like to do research in the future um, because that's what I really like to work on and iGEM has actually been great to um, make me, help me to understand that um, even more. So yeah, it was a great experience. It still is a great experience. We got a few more weeks left, yeah. so hopefully we'll all be done by the end of September and then uh, we have to produce a web page that's mm. called a wiki mm -hmm. so we have to produce a wiki by um the first of november end of october uh, just a few weeks before the final conference in boston mm -hmm. where we'll have to present our findings and actually do a mm -hmm. formal presentation mm -hmm. yeah do you think you guys have a good chance of placing pretty high I think we do, to be honest. Um, of course, we're trying to be as ambitious as possible, but um, we want to keep it real. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And, but yeah, I think we're on track, hopefully, for a gold medal. And Excellent. We'll see. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Would you say that you had some of your own expectations when you took the uh, internship? For iGEM, is there, do you feel like your expectations are being met? What were the kinds of, maybe what were kinds of some challenges that came up that you hadn't anticipated? Um, I would say um, my expectations have definitely been met, yeah, <laughs> because I already knew, um, I quite enjoyed research, so I already knew that's what I wanted to do. Um, so it was just uh, confirming really that I do enjoy it. Mm -hmm. um, some of the challenges were definitely working in a field that's not really mine mm -hmm. and it's not really my background, it's not really um, what I studied for um, in terms of the bigger picture. Um, so I'm still doing politics mainly, what I'm doing at the moment is politics and law and just social issues, so that's entirely my subject. Uh, but I'm dealing with them in a in a picture that's not really mine. So in a scientific world that I've never really um, had to deal with before because, I mean, my last uh, biology class was probably <laughs> 10 years ago, <laughs> so it was high school. Um, and so I'd forgotten almost everything. I remember one of the first few times that I went into a lab um, they made me try to peep it and yeah. <laughs> stuff like that. I was like, whoa, okay. <laughs> this is just good memories from school. Um, I mean, I quite enjoy that, but that's not really um, what I was planning on doing. Um, but I think it's still interesting because I got to see um, what I'm doing from a different perspective. So I'm working on something that is what I actually enjoy, what I'm passionate about. Uh, but it's been applied to a different world that I didn't really have to deal with until um, a few weeks ago. Um, but I really do enjoy it because I like to have just a bigger picture, a bigger perspective and seeing that what I'm doing is actually useful for someone. Mm -hmm. And I think that that works really well with science. Next, we spoke with Natalia and Hannah, who are two third year genetic students. Uh, also working on the biological component of the biosensor and they'll tell us more about the development of an E. coli strain that will be the actual biosensor part um, and Hannah will also talk about a satellite component of the iGEM program that is helping to assess experimental tools used in the lab. Um, I'm Natalia, mm -hmm. uh, I am from Poland and um, just as Hannah we are third year genetic students going into fourth year and we I think everybody was sort of spending third year looking for some opportunities to do internships or get some uh, work placements or 
um, some experience in lab work and we know about iGEM and you know kind of um, Professor Sean Collins mm -hmm. came around and he gave us a presentation about what, about what iGEM is about and so we applied um, and got onto the team. Mm -hmm. So it, was, it sounded very interesting because it's not only science but like you said um, public outreach and uh, human practices and then uh, we get to like speak to people and and do a bit of a kind of office work and like um, inform bioinformatics as well as wet lab work and it was kind of like a nice mixture of things mm -hmm. I think. And I'm Hannah and I'm also third year genetics as well from Italia um, and I'm from Scotland originally so just stay here. <laughs> here for university um, and mm. yeah I um, was just really interested in the whole concept of iGEM because I hadn't really thought about what I was going to do over the summer mm -hmm. but then you came around and I was like oh that'd be great <laughs> just apply for that and see if I can get it. Good. Nice. nice. So can you give us a little bit of a background on the project itself and um, Amber said that there's kind of different teams mm -hmm. so what's your your part of the of the project? So we want to build a biosensor and to engineer E. coli um, to sense Campylobacter um, on the chicken. Mm -hmm. So we are hoping to engineer um, a device that we could swap the chicken or any food in the kitchen because Campylobacter gets spread very easily and then put the swap into our little device and our bacteria will glow green or show some mm -hmm. other kind of signal um, when they, once the Campylobacter is there. So um, the main, there are th I think main, three main parts of the biosensor because we were trying to incorporate a few inputs mm -hmm. um, to make it more specific. So um, I think the main part is um, utilizing an MTLR opron mm -hmm. that is found in pseudomonas yes, yes, so so naturally mm -hmm. um, and it's an opron um, with a repressor protein that binds to xylulose sugar and once xylulose binds then a set of genes are switched on and xylulose is in the capsule of Campylobacter mm -hmm. therefore if the xylulose is present in the sample then it would um, produce a signal. Um, I myself am working on a different part of the project so I am looking into the RRC opera um, which is a bit more research and there's more information about it um, and it's not as new as the MTLR for us um, but it naturally the RRC protein binds to arabinose not xylulose. Mm -hmm. So what me and uh, Jane are doing, we're trying to mutagenize the RRC protein. Um, we're targeting the amino acids that are present in the sugar binding site um, because yeah, we're hoping that we could make it bind xylulose rather than arabinose. Because as we mutated before um, to bind other sugars, mm -hmm. not xylulose specifically, but we'll see if we can achieve that. So that's my part. Um, my part isn't really to do with the project as much. Every year iGEM sets up a series of experiments called the Interlab, which a lot of teams do to see how replicable mm. um, science is on different types of equipment and in mm. different conditions and everything. So that's what I'm doing. So it's testing um, GFP with different promoters and ribosome binding sites to see strength of the promoter and the strength of the writers and binding site. Mm -hmm. So we'll do that and a lot of other teams will do that and we all submit our information and then the paper gets published on that. So oh, very nice. Very nice. Like Collaboration is key. Working on as a team as I'm sure you've been finding, you have to know how to deal with challenges together mm -hmm. as well as between one another. And that I think is those kinds of interpersonal personal skills are things that you only learn kind of in the trenches as opposed to in courses or, mm -hmm. or anything. How, uh, spe speaking of kind of like course application versus what you're doing now, how well do you feel your coursework at the university is being applied to your iGEM research? 
Like it's certainly been difficult to make that shift from like this is what we're going to do to mm. us having to come up with the ideas ourselves. But I think we have been well equipped with the lab work that we've done. It's definitely helped quite a lot with getting us ready for this. Yeah. And reading papers and stuff. Mm. That's made doing all our research a lot easier, but it still is with quite a steep learning curve. Although yeah. it did help quite a lot. Mm. Of course, so our practical work helps a lot. Also, um, the theory behind the different machines or uh, methods mm. that we're using, so we know that we could do PCR to get this outcome. We could do yeah. this to do to get this. Um, but yeah, it's been quite a big step from. At uni, we mostly just follow protocols, and we often don't think about what we're doing, or we're not we're not being told what each step is really for. Mm -hmm. um, we just see a bunch of liquids and we're like, okay, so number one, pipette this into yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Whereas now we really have to think through and troubleshoot and know what we're doing and why we're doing this, which is which is much. Yeah. You have a very clear idea of how our everyday life is. Yeah. <laughs> so, in terms of the actual of the project for the biosensor, you said that uh, the first operon that you have is to identify which uh, sugar. The, yeah, and this is uh, specific only to this uh, yeah, bacteria. Yeah. Um, um, yeah. So, how specific will be if this is like your biosensor? Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if you take. If you swap from other, like whatever, from your kitchen top, is it going to be only f identifying this uh, specific organism? Or? So not many um, bacterial pathogens or organisms have cellulose mm -hmm. in their capsule, uh, but we have found one mm -hmm. parasite that's yeah. on the chickens. Mm -hmm. It's, it is a... Uh, it's not a bacterium though, it's no, a I can't remember the name of it. Yeah, okay. But, um, it doesn't produce the autoinducer 2 yeah, molecule, so our, one of the other bits of our biosensor is sensing the autoinducer 2, so it's like new both signals to know that it's kind of Ah, uh, okay, so that's okay. That's we're working around okay. now. Right. Mm. Making a two part. So I didn't mention the third part of the biosensor here, which is the quorum sensing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's sensing. so it's going to be like kind of three tests. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Make it a bit more specific. So you had mentioned that the output will mm -hmm. be either a fluorescence or some sort of color change. Mm -hmm. um, how long does it take? Is it immediate? Yeah, not sure. Yeah, we're uh -huh. still in not done putting tests, pieces, yeah. pieces and things together. We've not tested them mm -hmm. yet. So. Mm -hmm. so what would you say the um, give us like a top the top greatest thing that you feel this project has kind of given you personally and what would you say the top challenge has been working on this project or something you didn't expect it doesn't have to be challenge doesn't have to be bad yeah it can be good too. I think my top thing that it's given me is I feel a lot more confident in knowing what I need to do and how to do that and the bad thing is it's made me realize how um much stuff goes wrong in science. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> just getting over that and trying to just stay calm. Mm. It's been a little bit difficult when things are not working and then not working and just can't figure out why. Yeah, perseverance is yeah, a hard definitely. lesson. Yeah, like, just... <laughs> or stubborn. Maybe you just like need to be stubborn. Yeah, <laughs> this is, I don't remember who with whom I was talking very recently and I was saying I'm stubborn, you know, when it comes to that. And then he said, if you want to be a scientist, you have to be stubborn. Yeah. That's the only way to overcome. Yeah, because nothing works the first time. Or if it works the first time, it won't work the second time. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. When you're paying more attention. <laughs> yeah, I think it's similar for me. The greatest thing is designing my own experiments and having like um, the whole lab for ourselves so we can... I can go and choose which machine I need to use that day, what what reactions I need to run, and I kind of have access to everything, and I'm thinking about everything myself. Mm -hmm. um, and to get from A to B, that's sort of, I need to think about what to do, so that's the greatest. And the greatest challenge is, yeah, I think same, is because um, you don't really know what's happening in the tube until maybe two days later you can run yeah. into a gel or something and then it shows that it's it's not worked 
and you don't really know which step has gone wrong. You don't know whether to start from the beginning or the middle and how to troubleshoot yeah. that. So. Yeah. No, it's good time management skill development yeah, for sure. Definitely. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah. It sounds like, sorry, Maria. Um, no. It sounds like you've really, you're getting like a true, a true perspective on mm. what, um, mm. what everyday lab really looks like. So if you're thinking about going on to doing a master's or a PhD or going into, you know, getting a, a technical job, that's, mm. that's what everyday looks like. I think that I think that sometimes things not working out as frustrating as it is. It's also kind of like where you're most create you're most creative. Yeah, that is yeah, true. yeah. Um, Do you plan to present to the institute your work? Do, are you gonna do like any presentation, like to us, for example, to see what you have achieved? Have you thought about it? I think we probably will definitely yeah. for practice for the Boston yeah. presentation, yeah. especially. I think we'll yeah, yeah. Because that would be something. very interesting for many students, even for students that are on the undergrad mm -hmm. uh, level. It of might be good feedback too from different perspectives mm -hmm. of the research. Do you communicate with other groups at all? Yeah, we had a meet up for most of the Scottish teams and a couple of the English teams as well a couple of weeks ago, just to meet everyone and talk about our mm -hmm. ideas together. So not too much competition in between. <laughs> but they are going for the gold. That's here, right. So. so can you, so is that is that how it works? So it, you say we're submitting for gold, or are you just saying to get a gold, we know we need to have at least these many things yeah, ticked? Yeah, yeah, there's just specific criteria for bronze, silver, and gold. So mm -hmm. all of the teams can end up getting a gold. So it's not ah. too it's not too cutthroat and competitive. Ah, so, I see. Right. That's so you place nice. no matter what, yeah. really. And then, oh, nice. And that's you good. Can win for specific um, subcategories, and mm. there's an overall winner as well. Mm. So. Mm. That's nice because mm. it's not this tough competition where yeah. you don't want to say you your lose. idea, you know, or whatever. Yeah. It's like, yeah, mm -hmm. that's that's good. I like it. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. Finally, Maria and I talked with Greg and Ruben, who are the biomedical engineers students. That's part of the iGEM team. And they'll tell us a little more about how they're preparing the substrate for detection and the housing for the biosensor. And they give us a really good perspective of the process of developing the fluidic device and the application of the biological components of the project. Hey, I'm Greg, I'm a year biomedical engineer. I just, well, both me and Ruben are, we just finished our future exams. How I got involved with IHM was the supervisor, Julian, who's been running it for several years. He like, asked around the, our year and asked if anyone would be interested, gave us a little description of what the core of the project is and it sounded really interesting so I signed mm -hmm. up and applied to do it, lucky enough to get picked. Mm -hmm. I'm Ruben, like uh, Greg said, I'm also a third year biomedical engineer and um, so the way I got involved was I, I sort of asked Julian in like past years as well whether iGEM was running and how to get involved but last year I had managed to get a different sort of thing over summer um, so it ended up being that I didn't apply to, to do it last year, so I did it. I applied this year instead because I'd also been asking about this year. Nice. Yeah. Cool. And uh, okay, tell us a bit uh, about this famous biosensor that we have. <laughs> Listen yeah. a lot about the social aspects or the policy. We have learned a bit of the biology. Now it comes to the engineering. The, what, what, what the geneticists are doing is that they're um, trying to get or trying to in, encode a, or like design a genetic circuit that will detect zygotes, mm -hmm. um, a type of sugar, on the surface of, a, of Campylobacter. Um, and so what we're trying to do is basically prepare the or extract the zygotes or Mm -hmm. in such a way that it's available to the biosensor or the, the genetic circuit which will be inside a different bacteria. Um, we're trying to prepare the cellulose for detection by that genetic circuit inside the bacteria. So um, what we're doing is we're just, we have, uh, there was, there's a paper that describes the extraction of cellulose from the cell surface of Campylobacter, and we're basically just trying to um, miniaturize that 
processed mm -hmm. um, onto a small plate, mm -hmm. and that's basically our aim. Yeah. And both <laughs> of you, you are working on the same project, uh, like the same, because what I, we understood is that the people of the item they have like particular tasks. So both of you are you are doing the same thing, kind of. I mean, we we we're both making the biosensor yeah. together. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but they may have like a little. Like little things that we're doing separately, mm -hmm. but it's all with, towards a biosensor. Yeah. 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 Okay. So we always know what one yeah. another are doing, and then like what one of us will do something, and then knowing what the other person's doing. Yeah, we can always help each other, like at yeah. any point. Like, mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little more about what your kind of day to day life has looked like so far with working on this project. You said that you know you're trying to create um, the surface that you can put the substrate it sounds like on it, the xylose, and um, but that you both have your own kind of independent tasks working towards that. So what what does your what what does a day in a life look like for you guys so far working on iGEM on your iGEM project? Um, <laughs> question. <laughs> I would say it's highly varied, just yeah. because, um, like, 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 like I was saying, um, we've had input from different people along the way, mm -hmm. and um, so our idea of what our biosensor should look like has been yeah. sort of evolving. We're on like our third or fourth iteration of what it should be. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. yeah. So where did you start, and where? What does it look like now? So I think we were both. Yeah, we we both had the idea of like a something that had small like really small channels it was a proper microfluidic device yeah. mm -hmm. and then um, we were told that that was bad so we, <laughs> but like b before that we'd been working on electronics and things yeah. like that trying to think of like a more fancy way of doing things and then we were saying that no no and the to some extent said what's the point because it's a lot more complicated than it need be mm -hmm. um so we dumbed it down and then we we dumbed it down maybe a bit too much. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it was, it was like, yeah, yeah that this isn't going to work. Yeah. You're going to need to make it a bit better than this, essentially. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so, yeah, that's where we've got to now. So it's kind of a merger of both the initial microfluidic chip idea with the simplified version that kind of mixes both together. Mm -hmm. Um, Hannah and Natalia were telling us that the idea is, is to have some sort of visual indicator that the E. coli will produce when it comes in contact with the, um, the xylose. Xy xylose. Xylose. Yeah. Yes. Um, so I guess the way that I had it kind of in my mind is that you'd have like kind of a solution of this bacteria, you'd like swab whatever chicken or whatever that you wanted to swab, stick it in the in the tube and like shake it around and then see. Uh, so, but you're saying that you you have like a like a chip or something that you would like yeah. push put the sample uh, in. The or? trouble with the xylose on the cell, the polysaccharide capsule of the bacteria, it. It is obviously part of the capsule, although it's released from it by passing it through acid and heating it up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that that's what we were pro using the chip as the processing to pass, like you'll swab it and then pass it through acid and then heat that up mm -hmm. so that the xylose can be removed from the capsule gotcha. and, and then it will flow through the chip to the detection. Yeah, so. okay. And how close you are on completing your task like uh, well we've got um, six weeks left <laughs> <laughs> so you're about six weeks away <laughs> yeah. do you think you're gonna have it uh, by the end we should do yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I, I can't see it taking the whole six weeks yeah to be honest. you can't really say how far you are away from something if you don't know how or what you might encounter along the way. Yeah, yeah, yeah of fair course. Enough. Yeah. Yeah. But we know that you guys are going to Boston in November. Um, yeah. Do you kind of have an expectation of having some preliminary results or a prototype built up? What are you What are you hoping to be able to present while you're there? Um, I think just a, a, like, like a, a fluidic chip mm -hmm. that doesn't leak. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. functions in the way we intended it to yeah. and uh, can give a result. Yeah. Mm. If we can get a prototype and test the individual components to make sure all the individual components work, 
hopefully assemble it all. But if we run out of time or whatever, then as long as we can show that each part works, mm -hmm. then in theory everything should work together. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good. That's a good way of going about it. So, are you machining these these chambers as well, or? Um, we'll be laser cutting a mm. plastic um, piece, and then um, sort of joining it. So we'll be three D printing a sort of mm. like pot that has a like hole at the bottom and goes into the tip. Like this is just obviously what what we're doing right now, mm -hmm. but that's okay. my change. Um, and then you like swab something, you put it into that pot, which will be three D printed, mm -hmm. um, and then that pot will sort of lead into the fluidic device. Mm -hmm. And then um, use a pipette, the top of the pipette to sort of push, to use air to push um, acid through the swab, mm -hmm. um, and then through into the plate, and then through uh, some stages mm -hmm. um, on the chip, and then to the detection strip. So that's mm -hmm. that's what we're doing. I don't know how you prepare the paper there. Uh, that's what I've, that's the thing I've been looking at recently. It's a uh, Gonna <coughs> make a hydrogel and then immobilize the our modified E. coli in the hydrogel and then using photopolymerization harden it into bands on the strip. Mm -hmm. So the E. coli that when they hopefully come into contact with xylose they'll express I think we're gonna go for chromoproteins now because they give a much stronger mm -hmm. visual colour mm -hmm. in GFP. So we'll have that in a band on the strip mm -hmm. that when Silas is there, it'll turn red within hours, mm -hmm. which is much sooner than days, which is yeah. really current methods are. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's right. what we were talking about yesterday. Is this the first kind of uh, internship that you guys have done in your studies so far? Or? It's, I mean, it's the first been, but yeah. one that I've done, yeah. yeah. No, last year I I did a, a, a sort of work in a lab, um, just in a, in the Rankin building, um, mm -hmm. the other end yeah. of campus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Good. What have you been finding particularly challenging about this aspect of the of the project? Um, knowing where to go. <laughs> um, like, I mean, you do. Neither of us have any experience in designing mm -hmm. sensors or things like that. It's not really something that we're taught mm -hmm. uh, in in our course so far. Uh, yeah, so far. Um, yeah, actually, I think next year we have a course okay. specifically for biosensors. But um, uh, yeah, just just knowing what di in what direction to go in because we we don't know about what materials to use, how to how to prepare them. Um, we do, uh, it's just the sort of thing that you need experience mm -hmm. and, and like an instinct based on that experience mm -hmm. uh, to be able to do well or without without as much mm -hmm. yeah. um, difficulty. So how are you getting over that uh, kind of speed bump? One of the supervisors that helps run it, Julian, uh, he is a biomed engineer and he's involved himself with a lot of biosensors, so when he's been around, which he was busy the first like, few weeks of the project, uh, but when he's been around, he's been helping us whenever he can, giving us his experience and advice, uh, and then giving us contacts of other people that would be able to help us when he mm -hmm. can. So he needs lots of communication. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So you guys are both engineering students, yeah? Um, are you from a more biological part of engineering? Are you coming from a mechanical side of engineering? Um, I would say it's more of an even spread. Mm -hmm. I don't think, uh, like, we both, we, ha we haven't had any choice of what we do up until now. I see. Um, <clears throat> just within our modules, maybe, we have choice of, like, what what we want to, like, if we're given a task and then it says do something around this task, mm -hmm. that's about yeah. the level of freedom we have. But other than that, it's not really, like, it's it's just everybody does the same thing. Mm -hmm. So, and then we have usually a couple of courses a year on biology, um, some on maths, and then some on, like, more 
uh, sort of biomaterials, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. It's not quite math, it's not quite biology, it's about yeah. both, and mm -hmm. you can really categorize it properly in, into that sort of. Mm -hmm. um, and we also have electronics as well. So, mm. um, it's a very broad collection. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Some yeah. aspects of traditional engineering is yeah. well thrown into yeah. Yeah. biology classes yeah. that the other like, people in the project also do. Okay, mm -hmm. thank you, you guys. Stuff. We really appreciated the time that Ambra, Natalia, Hannah, Ruben, and Craig took out of their schedule to talk with us, and we really wished them the best of luck in November, and we hope to hear about how they, their project fares um, at the large iGEM meeting in Massachusetts. Good luck to them. You can follow the whole iGEM team on Twitter and Instagram, at Glasgow underscore iGEM. Uh, they put out a lot of really great images and tweets. Definitely check them out. You can also find other podcasts that we've done on the IMCSB website at the University of Glasgow. You can follow Emily Armstrong at Emily X Armstrong on Twitter. You can also find Maria at M underscore Papanatsu. And you can find me, Emily Larson, at ERLarson underscore PhD on Twitter. See you next time. <laughs>